Welcome to the Fantastic Story Society. A place for the most unusual stories and storytellers. Including your Masters of Ceremony, Max Tim, and Scott Marcus. This is fun. This is our technical first episode. Our pilot was labeled episode zero, uh, where it was just me and Scott. And, and if this is the first time you're tuning in, we're not going to go too in depth in terms of who we are and our past and everything. I mean, that was really what episode zero is all about. So if you want to push pause, go to episode zero. You can listen to that. Tell some Max, fun. Max got uh-huh. to some real truths. Broke down. Cried a lot. It was yeah, really right. tough. Yeah, yeah, it was like a therapy session. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, that was a fun episode because we shared some personal, you know, spooky little stories. Um, but at the same time, we explained that our podcast here and this, you know, quote unquote society that we're trying to start is about fantastic stories that don't necessarily have to only deal in the paranormal because of our natural tendencies toward enjoying those stories. We'll probably be telling those more often, but also because Scott is a paranormal expert. He's done some ghost investigations and some is, uh, you know, <laughs> light. <laughs> A yes. light, you know, <laughs> I'm putting that lightly. I've joined him on a few. But yeah. in this episode, we interview our first guest, Jeff Belanger, who is the lead researcher and has been since episode one of Ghost Adventures. But he's so much more than that. Uh, again, we referenced that in episode zero. But, uh, you know, this is fun, man. I think we've got a good episode here. I mean, how, what do you, what's your best way to summarize Jeff Belanger and who he is? Maybe that's a good way to start. He is one of the best uh, of any kind, not just talking about ghost stories or talking about macabre subject matters, but just one of the most engaging storytellers I've ever known and uh, yeah you'll hear me gush a little bit about this even during the episode because I've known him uh, for several years now we run in the same circles a little bit we do a lot of the same paranormal conferences and that's where I first met him uh, and found out that wow if if this guy is speaking this is a lecture that you're not going to want to miss because he's going to have something interesting to say but more importantly perhaps he's going to have really fun ways to say it so he's just a tremendous storyteller yeah as much as our show is about the, the spook in the macabre and the dark it's really it's about writing it's about how to present these really fantastical stories yeah right it's the it's the interviews with the people who love the fantastic stories so it's a little bit more of a spotlight on the the guest and of course just because of who the guests are they're going to be telling some fantastic stories you know so that it's not just tell us what your recent finding is you know why we love those podcasts and we love those shows i watch them all the time josh mm-hmm. gates is one of my favorites and this is more about let's bring on this expert in a storytelling capacity, find out what it is that he or she loves to do and why and some of her, their background. And we'll get we'll get into all that. You know, we'll, we're going to finish this first segment up with a little bit of a recap. So we kind of segue you into the interview with Jeff. But we'll just first talk about what we've been up to. You know, I've hosted a bunch of podcasts back on the Jeff little uh, topic, but uh, for a long time for the uh, for Scott, and I both work with International Screenwriters Association and I have my own coaching company called The Story Farm. And I host have hosted a lot of podcasts guests in the past. Jeff is probably one of the the best guests I've had on. Easily, oh, wow. Really. That's I, impressive. He was, he was so great and just really engaging. And the stories he told were just so much fun. But anyway, I, I, I just wanted to say that so that people can stick around and really listen to that interview because it's worthwhile. But so tell us, Scott, what have you been up to? And, um, you know, any exciting news, things you've got on? An incredible location that's going to blow your mind, but also exciting news. And this isn't even mine, so I'm just going to piggyback my wonderful fiance's exciting news. Oh, I love it. As as you just mentioned, Josh Gates, he's one of our favorite show hosts and producers. He, you you, you know him from Destination Truth when he was going looking for uh, cryptids and ghosts and all that and amazing far off places, but always with a lot of humor mixed in. Uh, and of course, now he's got the show Expedition Unknown, where he uh, goes into some some mysterious history more so or lost history, lost artifacts and that kind of stuff. In but some is, really wild locations. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Stuff that it would take. It seems like at least it would take a month to get to because they're so just off the beaten path. And some of these stories, it would be fun to to talk to them about how they even find some of these stories because they are not 
always your most well-known no, legends. There have been a lot of legends that I was like, "What? I've never." There was that one um, recently, the the, the D- Dmitri Pass or, or the Russian name of the the, oh, the pass, yes. and they went up to like the Siberia, and these hikers got marooned, and they all died in a really mysterious way. We love the show; it's on the Travel Channel, and we'll just keep plugging that in every single episode until Josh agrees to be a guest. <laughs> Exactly. Like, <laughs> Enough already. I'll show up. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so, so my uh, my fiance uh, Wendy Lynn Sots, she is a, a part of a great band out here in the Midwest called Sunspot, and they have. A uh, paranormal podcast. So not what we're doing. Uh, get, really getting into the nitty gritty of the paranormal. We're talking about storytelling. They are the types that would interview somebody that has had a profound experience d- investigating demons or something along those lines. Yeah, right. Or or talking about fun subjects like the chupacabra. And each episode they record a new song, uh, and they've been doing it for two hundred and sixty plus weeks and counting. Where every Is single it that week- long. Yes, several years now. This will be fun to get into in the future when talking about songwriting uh, in so many different levels, including the business side, uh, because part of what they do is they put their songs that they create into this library registered with who knows what. That's not my field at all. So this we definitely need an expert to talk about songwriting and monetize yeah. how to songwrite. But they have this big library that is searchable by producers to get placements and they've gotten uh, songs put in the the fast and the furious seven i think it was yeah. uh, the dvd special features it's they've got a song in there oh and my there's god dead again in tombstone a danny trejo movie they've got a sunspot song in there <laughs> uh, but they have a great song called el chupacabra and we were watching josh gates looking for the chupacabra and and right when we were starting to think like oh god if only they could have placed their song in here and then boom oh my god there's mike there's lead singer they're they're using it they're using our song oh my god <laughs> it was it was that thing you do that moment where they first hear the radio, song <laughs> the radio. right the radio yeah <laughs> it's like no way because we love this show so much we yeah. just we've always loved the show so much and then suddenly josh gates is sitting at a bar drinking an El Chupacabra cocktail and they hear like when he's like, there's my drums. I hear my drums. (laughs) It was a really wonderful. God, That's wild. Oh my (laughs) God. Yeah. And of course I had, I just watched it last night, the episode and I skipped over it. I didn't even, (laughs) because it's like this little insert within the show. Yeah, it's kind of yeah, it's a little little tiny little beeline, be storyline to yeah. get away from the fact that they've been in a cave in night vision for the last half hour. Right, right. I had no idea. That's awesome. So, yeah. what is this location? So, I was out in this small town that Max, even though you're a Wisconsin native, uh, I would, I'd bet a good amount of money that you've never heard of it, called Schulzburg, Wisconsin. Okay. Nope. It is in the uh, the southwestern portion of the state, not too far from the Illinois uh, border. We're out there with th- these wonderful people, Robin and Ted. Uh, actually, his name is Ted Williams, but not the guy that hit 400 <laughs> a few years back. <laughs> they run the Haunted Galena Tour Company, and they were such amazing, gracious hosts. We took the tour and were uh, infinitely excited about just the experience of being on that tour. And they said, well, come back tomorrow. Let's go to some other interesting locations, including one that they'd never been to, and which is across the border in Schulzburg. Uh, there's a place called the Berry Tavern. So the Berry Tavern was a stagecoach stop in the mid 1800s, mid to later 1800s. And we think of a tavern like a pub nowadays. Yeah, right. But, but in, in this incarnation, it was kind of a hostel. So you would, they had, I think, seven guest rooms. Sure, right. Yeah. yeah, there was a family that lived there. There was a bar. There was a restaurant. It was it, it was even the, like the little post office and whatnot. You could go and vote yeah. there once upon a time. There was a cholera outbreak. Being on the transportation lines, somebody at one point that was inflicted with this devastating sickness came through Berry Tavern and passed along cholera. Mm. And cholera is just a, such a devastating, devastating, dark outbreak. I guess the positive about it is that it kills you fairly quickly, but it spread very easily, very quickly. And I, I'm, I'm sorry if this is your first episode, because this is dark quickly. here. <laughs> Let's get there. <laughs> but um, but but so in all, 23 people were inflicted with cholera and 17 people ended up dying very quickly. 
And even to the point that people would say that a stage, the next stagecoach came up and they just saw a pile of bodies outside and they Oof. just kept on going. It had to have been about half the town. It was, well, and it was people passing through between Galena oh, and right. Chicago. Yeah. So uh, the most devastating story is that a, the, the man of the house, the guy that ran the company, was in Chicago at the time. So he wasn't even there to take care of his family. And he came home to find his wife and four of his five children dead already and the fifth ch- child hiding in the, in the barn. Wow. Now, you jump to today. This is one of the oldest buildings in Wisconsin. It still stands. It, it's in really good shape, but it's not in use in any way, shape, or form. It's kind of maintained but abandoned at the same time, if you will, so it's not inhabited at all. Mm. And behind the house, there is a cellar, and that's where they ended up piling up a lot of the bodies because, you know what, they could not bury people because among the dead was the local coffin maker. Oh, my God. <laughs> So this is what we're talking about here. And apparently it's in that cellar that people have heard phantom voices, disembodied voices, uh, and and had other odd types of paranormal interactions. And the uh, building, we could not get into the building, which just looks like a simple farmhouse, really. It's a two-story, white, nice-looking farmhouse. But we were able to gain access into the cellar. And uh, it's kind of a two-tiered cellar where it goes deep and then deeper uh, it was just creepy to be in that space, first off, which is that's also kind of part of what we do when we're getting into the paranormal. It's going into a space and trying to uh, unwind and feel comfortable and relax so that you can start an investigation in a place yeah. that is anything but comfortable. And do you have cholera now? Uh, you know, I did not lick the walls. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, I would have. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we shot some video. I'm going to put together a... a, a a nice video with drone footage and do a little voiceover of it. Uh, I have not yet gone back to re- listen to the recordings, but uh, this is some of the unique places I get to visit or, or we all get to visit if you're into the world of the paranormal. And this is one of those places. How has this not been on every ghost hunting TV show? Seriously. Cause it's, it's so it's engaging. So perfect. Yeah. It's amazing. It's remote. It's in the middle of cornfields, like for miles and miles and miles and miles around. And uh, it's so preserved in the time period. In our interview with Jeff, he says he doesn't necessarily suggest locations to ghost adventures. They just tell him to do some research, uh, research on something. And he does it. But it'd be interesting if he had ever heard of this place, because that it sounds like, come on, this is a done deal, you know? Well, you do this a lot. You drive, you and Wendy both just drive all yeah. over the place. You're like, we're going to go to Tennessee and climb into a cave. With International Screenwriters Association, I love that I get to travel for film festivals. Yeah. And then once I'm on location, sometimes in a city I've never been or a town I've never been, then when the red carpet is done, all right, what else can I see while I'm out here? And the same thing with Wendy being in a band. She goes on tour. So, yeah. okay, we're playing a gig in Austin. What's on the way to Austin? Let's <laughs> stop in there and, and poke around a little bit. Yeah, that's why I love road trips, man. They're just There's something around every corner. Absolutely. You're up to a lot of other things, but, um, you know, just in terms of uh, time, we've got, like, we want to get people into our Jeff uh, interview. I don't know if I've been up to as exciting of things is, is that because I wish I could have joined you. Hey, um, creation is always exciting. And you are in the world of making things and helping other people make the things that are passionate to them. I've just been up to my eyeballs in just developing stuff and, and not necessarily stories or scripts. I mean, we're doing that too. We have a whole bunch of scripts that we've optioned and we're trying to send out around town, you know, from a producer standpoint. But I've got an online course that I've had for a while called The Craft Course. You can go to thecraftcourse.com. Uh, if you want to learn about the storytelling process, it's primarily geared towards screenwriters, but you can use these elements, you know, for any type of storytelling. And I've been diving into that and updating it, putting videos in there. It's only $99, 12-week course you can keep for life, so you can check that out. So I've been spending a lot of time on that. But then Felicity uh, Wren is the director of development with ISA, and and she and I um, have been doing so many things in terms of events. We were in Seattle last weekend at the Connecting Writers uh, with Hollywood conference. Spent It was just an overnight uh, stay, and we opened up their conference and talked about voice and what makes you unique and why you're the one to tell your story. And then we had a panel. Then I moderated with Women in Film, which is an organization that if you are female, you need to look up Women in Film. They're amazing. We had three female panelists, and they were just so dynamic and and so successful and smart and just had so many amazing things to say in terms of advice to people that were in the audience. I'll I'll Um, put you on the spot a little bit because I was not there, unfortunately. I was not present at this one. 
Was, was there a, a favorite bit of inspiration or a bit of sure. insight that you never maybe you'd never heard before? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, it's not that I hadn't heard this specifically, but I think it was such a great comment. I don't know if somebody asked the question, but uh, it, it came up. In, one of the writers was saying that in order to be noticed, if you will, as a, as a writer, a storyteller, you just have to be a writer or a storyteller as like as ridiculous as mm. that advice is because it's so general she then went on to explain that don't just be an author don't just be a screenwriter you have to be a writer which means you have to be building yourself an audience in as many ways possible write and develop and produce a fiction podcast do a non-fiction podcast write articles and send it to the huffington post uh create a blog you know build an audience and, and social media and so you get your voice out there so people understand who you are meanwhile yeah, write those books, write those scripts. And it was such a great piece of advice because we so many creative people think, I'm a painter. Well, great, but unless you're Monet, <laughs> nobody's really going to know who you are because, you know, this isn't exactly a huge money-making trade, which is fine. It's not like you have to mm -hmm. do it to make money. But in order to be noticed, especially in today's day and age, you have to build your audience. So from a storytelling standpoint, I think that was probably the best piece of advice that you just have to always be creating something. And I've sort of taken that advice. Uh, it wasn't necessarily in direct you know, relation to that comment, but it solidified mm -hmm. what I was doing because, you know, Felicity and I also host a Facebook live broadcast for uh, uh, International Screenwriters Association. You can go to their Facebook page, just search for International Screenwriters Association. And we have a Wine Wednesday broadcast. It's usually every other Wednesday night where we just pretty much drink a bottle of wine and talk about screenwriting in Hollywood. You can see a slow progression of us getting drunker. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> as slow as you think, stuff. buddy. <laughs> yeah. And it's fun. We just kind of, we don't, it, it, there's nothing formal about it. We just kind of get goofy we take questions from people um, but we usually have some form of a topic you know, like how to perfect your log line and stuff then we have third thursday's events we just had one this past week at canon you know like the camera company yeah. and we had guests that's what there. i shoot on canon's amazing and they're so helpful and if you're in la you can in and you're looking to produce or shoot something you can literally just go into their offices and get counseling from these people like what should i do what should i use so that was great and so there's just a whole bunch of things that i'm up to and, and i'm trying to finish my book uh at least the book two of the wish keeper you can find the wish keeper on amazon i'm finishing book two is done technically but i need to get the cover done and editing and i'm halfway through the third book well congratulations uh, i didn't know you were that far along and we'll say what your book is about a a supernatural creature. Yes. I mean, that it's so funny because I, I could go forever kind of talking about the impetus of the idea. But I've always loved fairy tales, folk tales, myths, legends, you know, much less the paranormal, which I guess you could in some ways call a fairy paranormal. Um, but um, I've always just Absolutely. been Absolutely. There's a lot of people in my in my circle of weirdos who who love to talk about the fae, the fairies. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's a paranormal yeah. uh, phenomenon and also cultural, of course, uh, country right. to country. Right. And there are so many different types of, of fae and they don't necessarily need to be these little winged creatures. You know, a fairy is much, well, I was going to say bigger, <laughs> but since we're dealing with size, bigger may not be the right word, but there are so many other versions of just the Tinkerbell version where the fae is concerned. Fae, you know, have been known as these little goblin, scary, nasty creatures that are really horrible and evil to being adult size, and they're kind of almost siren-like. But then, of course, you have the little pixie elementals, and the Tinkerbell fairy was technically... You know, a little bit of a Disney creation, even though there were a lot of legends about actual little fairies that looked like Tinkerbell. But anyway, you know, my story deals with this 16 year old kind of anti Tinkerbell, even though she's only five inches tall, you know, traditional fairy. But she's got shredded wings because of an accident that happened when she was really little. Um, and she's the only fairy that is like this. You know, she can't fly. So it's kind of a story about a, a, a handicapped teenager dealing with, you know, a little bit of bullying, but she's extremely strong willed and she doesn't take no for an answer. So I built this world around the wishing process. Every time you make a wish, you're assigned a particular uh, wish keeper to take care of that wish. And that's the one thing that Shay, the main character, wants to do. But anyway, that book, I'm, I'm trying to finish that up much less. I'm excited about producing this podcast. That you and I are. That's excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> you know, come and on. There's going to be an episode where we have somebody on that can talk about these uh, supernatural creatures, and we'll, we'll really dive into the Wishkeeper even more. Yeah. Uh, 
But I do want to say, though, part of what we'll dive into is that this started as a, a spec screenplay, a passion screenplay that became mm-hmm. a book and went through a, a zillion rewrites. And I read mm-hmm. a half a zillion of them, maybe, <laughs> as you were yeah. going. Twelve drafts of a script. Then I, I wrote a, the a book and then, you know, five drafts of that later. <laughs> and I but I do have to say, like, I, I the. All of those times reading it and really loving the world you created and all that and and the character, of course, that I it took me so long to for it to click that, oh, wow, this is about a handicapped person because it just didn't, yeah, right. it didn't feel like it. And I think there's something very important to that, that you're not beating people over the head with the idea that this is, hey, overcoming uh, a physical obstacle. It's just this is just her story and that's all there is to it. And that's her. You know, that's the character. She doesn't yeah. pay attention. She's like, whatever, man, this is my lot in life. She has that attitude. I wish I had that attitude, you know, because I, I created yeah. her because I kind of wanted to create somebody that I wish I could be like. But let's get into a little bit of a New England legend segue. Because yes. Jeff Belanger obviously is our guest and she, he's going to be diving into some really fantastic stories. Um, so the yes, one that is. you pick, picked out is what? Well, so, I mean, Jeff doesn't Jeff, talk about this one. Jeff does not talk point. about this, yeah. but I wanted to, uh, I guess, start to set the tone of uh, of the kind of a story that Jeff would love. And uh, this is not even treading on his territory because apparently Virginia is just outside of New England. As a Midwesterner, right. I don't know this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There is a story out of uh, very far northeastern Virginia, so very east coast, called The Bunny Man. Uh, we're in Fairfax, Virginia, Fairfax Station, Virginia. The legend is that there is this crazed person wearing a bunny costume that will that murders teenagers, basically. It's, it's very much like on the nose. Oh, urban legend. Usually it's a hook on the car door, but this one happens to be a psycho wearing a bunny costume. And move on right (laughs) but the the great part about just about all legends is that it comes from something like even the hook on the car door comes from the the phantom killer in 1947 in texarkana that was killing people and nobody could seem to find any clues about who it was so the press dubbed him the phantom killer which just sounds like an urban legend and then, then the legend sprung from that yeah the true story of the bunny man Oh, and actually, uh, I should go back to the legend is that the the bunny man would hang people from this place that to this day is known as the bunny man bridge. What was actually observed in October of 1970 was a a guy wearing a bunny costume. And and we're talking not a mall Easter bunny, but a guy wearing bunny pelts, an entire suit of bunny pelts. Presumably he trapped and killed in the woods where he lives. Uh, And again, I keep having to circle back. This is the true part <laughs> because it's yeah, really right. weird. <laughs> well, one of the eyewitnesses did say that she thought that she saw like something on her, her head, either like, a uh, oh, there's a name for the type of cone that someone wears, you know, in that horrible organization of the KKK. But um, or or they thought maybe ears or something. So I do remember reading that. This person was observed in this uh, kind of rural area. Now it's more of a suburb of Washington, D.C., but at the time it was even more remote. And he would be doing destructive things. Who would be vandalizing a house that was under construction still uh, with a hatchet. Hatchet always helps uh, for a good legend. There was one time a couple was having a conversation in a car and then their window shattered. That's when I, yeah, that was the part I read. Gotcha. And only yeah. to find a hatchet had come through their window and landed in the backseat of their car. Uh, of course, they sped away, but they saw this guy. And, and the most dramatic story involved a guy who went out looking for his lost cat and he found his cat. But unfortunately, in the clutches of this weird guy wearing a bunny costume who was eating, who's consuming the family pet. (laughs) Oh, man. So and and as outlandish as this sounds, this was reported on. It was a bit of a sensation in the 1970s. The, The Washington Post covered the story a lot. If the location of Virginia and uh, a bunny man sounds familiar at all yes indeed it did inspire the character of frank the rabbit in donnie darko yeah i've heard that too mm-hmm. i did a little research and and it's interesting that the wikipedia page does not mention donnie darko in correlation with the story necessarily it did have one little link in the bottom and i because i was waiting for them to be like inspired donnie darko but it's interesting that they didn't mention that i'd l- really love to talk to the the writer of donnie darko and say it's not exactly on the nose i mean donnie Darko is such a weird one yeah. itself yeah. and it is that 
rabbit that looks like a distorted uh, Easter uh, bunny, uh, you know, mall bunny. But uh, whereas this guy was just a guy wearing bunny pelts. So it took some inspiration, but not direct, you know. But what I love about the story is that you went to the bridge, didn't you? Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. And and this is a a wonderful thing (laughs) to to go to a location. I I was out there and we're going to get into a little bit of a a device that perhaps people can utilize if they're writing a good supernatural story, which is the idea that a place can have an impression left behind on it, whether or not anything actually happened there. Because myself and my research partner at the time, we were at this location. We laughed our way to the location because it was such a silly, over-the-top urban legend. And we know that there's actually nothing that happened at this location. That, yes, the bunny man did exist. He didn't kill anybody, but he did some weird stuff. And somehow, not too far away, there's this really creepy-looking train bridge that people connected with the bunny man for whatever reason, the way urban legends spiral. And uh, people said actual human beings would be murdered and hanged from this bridge, but that never happened. We know that never happened. So nothing actually happened here. Weird stuff happened a while away, (laughs) but somehow people come here looking for the bunny man. And as the legend goes though, uh, the bunny man would, in addition to hanging people here, he was chased away by police at one point. And as he crawled up the hillside to cross the train track and Amtrak went flying by and splattered him into a million pieces. The money man met his physical demise here. However, after the train sound vanished in the distance as the train went away, people could hear the maniacal laughter of the right. money man surrounding that's the them. That's the one part of the story I remember. I'm like, okay, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Today, we go there. Um, you know, several years ago, I was there. I was at the bridge, pull over, and my research partner would not budge. She would not leave the car. What? There's no reason to be afraid. Come out. Let's get some footage. Let's get some video. And she was terrified. She was absolutely petrified. Could not get her butt out of the seat. I was getting ticked off in the moment because we drove a long way to get there. Yeah. Like, all right, fine. Stay in the car. I go out and I do my shooting. And uh, and then, I, you know, we eventually leave. But it took me a little while, uh, a little space to have the clarity to realize that Since 1970, people have been coming to this place full of terror, full of dread, wondering if they would be the next to be killed, because this is kind of one of those high school dares to go out to this location and look for the bunny man. And you wonder, after all of that time, decades upon decades of filling a space with dread and terror, does it leave an imprint behind? Right. They're adding to the energy, to the space. I See, that kind of stuff, I obviously, it's in unprovable but i believe it i I believe that everything is energy that's why i can connect with this idea of a ghost in certain ways because it is energy repeating itself in certain types of hauntings so i get it like i'm that makes sense that's technically not haunted but it's arguably haunted by thoughts and feelings of the people who have visited it yeah it's haunted by the living and and so there's the possibility now that people that are completely unaware of the bunny man story might be in that area and they suddenly feel an impression, a feeling impressed upon them. They have no rightful reason to have, and they feel like it's haunted to this day. And again, they don't even know what the bunny man is. So now it has become haunted because so many people have filled it with their emotional energy. It's a perfect example and segue into getting uh, you, Mr. and Miss or Mrs. List listener, the interview with Jeff, because, you know, he said that a ghost is the past demanding to be remembered, which I love that quote. It's haunted, whatever it is, because a community says it is. You know, a legend is this living, breathing thing that's that's then indisputable. You know, like it's ingrained in our mind, which then makes it real, even going so far as saying the same thing as Santa Claus. You know, we know where he lives, what he looks like. It's real because we make it real. And even if you don't believe it, it's still haunting us because collectively we believe. And then what I love is that the he says the only way to make it go away is if everyone stops talking about it, mm-hmm. which is fascinating. I think we just leave it at that and say enjoy hearing Jeff tell us some creepy stories. We could not think of a better person to have on our first inaugural Launchpad episode than Jeff Belanger. Uh, He, for more than 20 years, has been exploring ghosts, monsters, history, and legends. The author of more than a dozen books that have been published in six languages. He's appeared in many television networks like PBS, Travel Channel, History Channel, CBS Bio, Amazon Prime, 
radio programs like Coast to Coast AM and NPR's Talk of the Nation. His PBS series New England Legends has been nominated for two Emmy Awards. His weekly New England Legends podcast, which you could go to at OurNewEnglandLegends.com, has been downloaded over one million times. He's been the writer and researcher for the Ghost Adventure Show on the Travel Channel since episode one, which is definitely saying something since they're on season 18 now. And uh, that's about all we have time for, so we're going to have to wrap this episode up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I hear that Jeff lives, or at least has visited Mars, and I think he's been to the moon a few times. Pretty well traveled. Uh, I'm kidding, but uh, after that bio, it's like, what else can you add to it? Well, I mean, he he is a, a exceptionally well traveled uh, individual, which we'll get into uh, as well. Because I think that has to inform a lot of the research and writing he does. I first met Jeff back in Chicago in 2011. It's been a, a long while now. Do you remember and, the meeting, Jeff? Yeah, this guy was like, "Hey, man, it's I can't believe it's <laughs> you." <laughs> yeah, of course, it was the Chicago Ghost Conference, and th- that's an event I've been to many times. And and Scott's been to it a bunch. And Scott writes books about you know. Know, weird things in Chicago. And so uh, us kindred spirits just find each other. Uh, weirdos just seek each other out. It's like magnets. You can't help it. I learned in that ghost conference uh, that I met you at that Jeff is an exceptional storyteller. And it's, you know, we're jumping ahead nine years now. And every time I see his name on the list of speakers, and uh, we just saw each other recently up in Michigan uh, for the yeah. Michigan Paracon, it's like, okay, buckle up because this is going to be good. And you have never disappointed. So I'm, I'm really excited to hear about how you found, find your voice as a writer, as a storyteller, and how you continue to have such amazing energy. Because I know you travel so much, you do so much. And how do you still have energy to do karaoke at two in the morning <laughs> in the hotel lobby? I don't know how you do it. I might pass it over to you to, to get into voice when it comes yeah. to writing and you can uh, bring Jeff in on this. One of these little assignments or exercises I make my writers go through is called voice pressure point. It's a nice little step into young Jeff Belanger and what happened <laughs> to push you into this direction. This idea of a voice pressure point is kind of looking back in your past at a moment in your life that you remember that changed your perspective in some way, either positive or negative. I can think of two moments that really had an impact. My dad is very worked corporate his whole life, worked for General Electric, you know, and and for most of his career, very corporate guy, really hustled to provide for his family, you know, so we could have a house and go to college and, and my sister and I and vacation and all that stuff. Worked really hard and in those early years barely scraped by. And I remember asking him, like, you know, Dad, did you have any dreams? You know, like at some point I was probably a tween or something, not even a teenager yet. He said when he was in college, he was really quite a skier. And he he lived in Massachusetts. He was skiing up at Mount Snow in Vermont and was really a good skier. And a friend of his, his father or something, was a scout for the U.S. Olympic team and told my dad, I think you have a shot if you... Wow. If you you know, did a did a, a winter with me. I think you have a shot at making the team. And he spoke to his dad and his dad's and, you know, my grandfather who, who said to him, well, you know, I, you're in college now. I think you should finish college and then you can always go look at skiing again. And so my dad set some wheels in motion at that moment and said, yeah, you're right. I'll just stay in college. And uh, uh, not to ruin the story, everyone probably already knows the ending. He never went and skied again, professionally or otherwise. Uh, And to me at that moment, I was like, I was so young. And I remember knowing you're in the prime of your physical shape, 18, 19, 20 years old once. You can go to college when you're 30, 40, 50, 60, uh, and so on. And, but you're only in the prime of your, your life as far as physical shape once, and you had a shot. And do you lay awake at night wondering, could I have gone to the Olympics? Because that would eat me up to know. Right. Even, if, totally. if, if, even if I didn't make it, that's okay. If I, if I, but I, just to know, I at least went for it and know for certain I didn't have what it takes to, to make the team. But God, what if I did? And so that was a moment where I was like, oh, man, I don't want to leave anything on the table. And that being said, by the way, this was the Vietnam era when my dad was in college. And because he had graduated college before almost getting drafted into Vietnam, learning he was going to be drafted and then got to uh, volunteer, he learned because he had a college degree, uh, the army puts you into a a whole different place because they don't want college graduates getting shot at as much as people that that didn't go to college. And that's just a a horrible injustice truth of, of the military. So who's to say? 
tried for the ski team and failed, might have died in Vietnam. You know, I, I don't know. You, you, it's tough to see the end of the game when you're back there. But I do remember that moment saying, man, I, I, it would bother me for the rest of my life if I didn't try. What is really interesting is how you reacted. Because some kids might have looked at that and said, that's probably going to happen to me too. You know, it's like you had a different momentum behind that. You took it as, I'm not going to let that happen to me. Yeah. And I was very young, really young. And like I said, not even a teenager, not even working yet. I never really conformed much throughout my life. And that that included like summer jobs while my friends are working at the grocery store for minimum wage. And I started like a sidewalk business. I was laying bricks and, and oh my God. was my own contractor, <laughs> you know, but I would make in one week as much money as my friends made all summer working minimum wage at the grocery store. And my parents are like, you should have like a real structured job. And I'm like, I have twice the money. What, what uh, <laughs> do you want to talk about supply and demand and economics? I don't know. Like, so I, I always just kind of did my own thing. The second moment that occurred was uh, I was a freshman in college and I went to Hofstra University for what it's worth, but I, I had no clue what I wanted to do. None. And it was the first week of my freshman semester, and I met the guys from the Campus Humor magazine. And they were just the biggest group of nerds and misfits and awesome. malcontents. You know, I mean, you could close your eyes and you could cast them right now, right? You could go to Central <laughs> Casting and you would be darn close to what I saw. You know, you, whatever your imagination has is probably about right. And uh, I said, well, these, this, these are my people. This is my tribe, obviously. And so I, I wrote a, like some funny limericky poem. It's crap in hindsight, but I wrote it and it was published in the first edition of that year. And I remember walking through the student center and the, when the magazine comes out, it, it's, we could swear and do all kinds of horrible things. So people tend to grab them and, and look at it because it's so outlandish. And I, I was walking by and I saw a guy sitting on a bench who I didn't know with the magazine open. And I look over his shoulder and he was laughing out loud to my my page. And I just went, whoa. I mean, it's a moment. It, it just time froze the whole tunnel vision. I just went, this is what I'm going to do. I don't know. I don't know how or what or whatever, but I'm going to write. And I never stopped writing from that, that moment is- on. That is awesome. That I, I always look back to where did my career start? Sophomore year writing for the high school newspaper. Like that's the first time I produced something. I created something that people that I didn't know personally w- w- was taking it in. So yeah, anytime I get to s- speak at a high school, I ask, hey, who's on who's on the paper staff? Because yeah, it's funny that you you start to realize the power of that's me transported across time and space to another person. I, I don't even have to be there to deliver it, right? I mean, yeah. it, 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 the, the power of that was, um, I was, uh, I, I just fell in a trance in that moment. And then- And it know, shows you, like that level of, you know, again, kind of going back to this idea of what's my voice, it's this idea of possibility. You saw so much as possible within that moment. And before then, you were kind of in this realm of, I don't know what to do, you know, with the rest of my life. I'm just kind of having fun. But then you but, but, see that. But he did have an entrepreneurial spirit already. Totally. And I see a lot of similarity there with you, Scott. You, know, you were kind of always that guy that would just sort of kind of have as much fun as you could, finding avenues of just ways to stay productive and create new things. And I think, I mean, is that kind of a common denominator a little bit in the ghost investigation and research world, Jeff, where people, you know, there's this level of possibility and you're always trying to find, you know, answers, et cetera. Uh, well, you know, you're asking, so, so we're, we're switching gears, really. You may not think we are, but we are. Um, so the writing life to me is very different than the paranormal research world. Yeah. Because okay. there are people who are paranormal researchers who don't write at all, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and just kind of do this stuff and maybe throw it up on a website. I, I'm really a story guy. And I realized that long ago. I, I, the paranormal drew me in. That's my subject. It's what I'm best known for. The function of writing and storytelling, I don't think is any different. There's some nuances, of course, when you're working in scary subjects, but paranormal research to me, and again, let me, let me separate the guys that sit in the dark and collect like EMF data and temperature data, which (laughs) doesn't, doesn't interest me at all. Right. I mean, like, that's just (laughs) not my idea of a good time to sit in the dark all night and take readings. But, but people are into that and that's awesome. Go for it. You know, by all means, let me know what you find out if you find any correlation, but I don't want to be there with you because I don't know, I'd rather be doing something else. The historical research, finding out the story, the backstory of what happened, that is of great interest to me. I always want to know how did we get here? You know, how did we get to the point where we're talking about a place being haunted or a monster lurking in the lake or in the woods or a UFO landing site? How did that happen? 
I took a mystery writing class in college with one of my favorite professors. I took everything he offered. He was like my creative writing professor. I was a creating writer, writing major. One mystery class. And I remember him saying, when you write a mystery, you start at the end. There's a crime, you know, like a murder. And then you just go backwards. And then you go backwards to, okay, then who are your suspects? What are their motives? And you just keep going back and back and back and back and back. And eventually you get to the start of the story. And that's how, that's how you craft one. And I'm like, that's kind of brilliant because a ghost story func- functions the same way. That totally. old scary house on the hill is haunted. There's a, a, a white lady in a, in a dress with a flower print on it. And she's in the second story window and she just stares out the window and then disappears. That's the end of the story. Let's go to the beginning. So now we got to go back. Who lived here? Who built it? Who died here? What happened? What could, what could be the motivator for something to hang around? What's the unfinished business? And we explore all of those questions to, to try to backfill in. And then, of course, you start and end with the ghost. You start with, there's the ghost in the window. You go back in time. You come back to the present, and there's the ghost in the window again. But now we've identified her, and now we understand, or at least think we understand the motive for sticking around and why she's here and why she's haunting and so on it becomes a very satisfying story that's is that how you kind of see it scott like when you're because you're totally into all the research and this history of everything as well yeah I, you know for me something that i i really enjoy about the paranormal is the idea that we might be able to use this bizarre <laughs> unorthodox technology or unorthodox means to perhaps solve a mystery and um i've got some stories that I was able to uncover for my book that by, by getting the word out there and sharing it with that broader mass audience, other people had other bits of the story. And there's one that is way too long to get into right away, but a little boy was seen here and we didn't know why. And people have seen him in this clothes and this other clothes and we've seen him in this location. We don't know why he's here. And then through time, people have said, well, we do have a record that a boy of that age died here, which we didn't have before. So had to dig into an old newspaper and found an obituary. And eventually family members came out and they said, hey, that was uh, a relative of ours who died there. And indeed, that, that's what the clothes were that he was wearing when he died. And so now, oh, my gosh, we had a ghost story and we had this ghost story for years. And now we know the why and the who, which that's thrilling when you can yeah. actually that never ha- almost never happens. But, man, that's that's uh, exhilarating when it does. I get it. No, I get it. So to me, um, I, so I wrote an entire book trying to, to define what a ghost is. And um, oh, I, I failed that. I failed miserably, by the way. It's a whole, <laughs> it's a whole book. It's like 15 bucks. And, um, and, I, and now that I've written it and really had time to process it, I think I can sum it up in a sentence and save everybody 15 bucks. <laughs> um, uh, to me, uh, you know, there's all these theories and there's like stone tape theory and the discarnate soul and the unfinished business and da 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 and the thought form and projection. To me, Simplest definition is a ghost is the past demanding to be remembered. That's it. It's the past coming to the present yeah. for some reason that we may not fully understand. And a place is haunted, not because I say it is, not because Scott says it is in one of his books. It's haunted because a community collectively says it is. A legend is a living, breathing thing, an indisputable living, breathing thing. If I say Bigfoot right now, you can you have a picture in your mind and and is he lurking in the city is he lurking in the suburbs no he's in the woods right he's in the pacific Mm -hmm. northwest he's eight feet tall he's got shaggy hair he looks like chewbacca we know Mm -hmm. if i just say one word and yet we've never found a dead one we've never captured a live one no one's ever shot one as far as we know and yet when i say the word you have a total understanding of what i'm saying if i say santa claus i don't have to say anything else you know where he lives you know what he looks like you know so much um and that's the power of legend the legend of santa is indisputably real the power uh, the legend of bigfoot is real the legend of the lizzie borden house being haunted is real even if you don't believe in ghosts this thing is is hanging around. It's haunting us uh, as a community. And it doesn't matter if individuals don't believe in it. Collectively, we do. And the only way the ghost goes away is if we all stop talking about it. There's no other way. No other cleansing you can mm-hmm. do. You can't call Ghostbusters. You can't call psychics. Nothing works except everyone stops talking about it. I think this is a great segue to talk about your current project, which is uh, your New England Legends podcast. I do want to get back more into your origins of how you started to marry folklore and research into creation and showbiz and all that. This is a very interesting podcast. It's uh, about 10 minutes or so uh, per episode. And as you say, give us 10 minutes, we'll tell you a pretty cool legend. And 
unlike most paranormal podcasts, which are interviews like we're doing right now, or just somebody talking at their microphone, you do more of a, a radio show presentation style. Yeah. How did you come up with this idea of uh, storytelling? So podcasting is something I've sort of, I've been, I'm, a, I'm first of all, I'm a junkie. I am a consumer. I love them. Uh, I, <laughs> I enjoy listening to them when I'm exercising, when I'm driving, whatever. They're, they're great. And the tricky thing about interviews, and I used to do an interview show called 30 Odd Minutes years ago, which was fun. It was video and we, we were doing something different. And, um, and you didn't take yourself too seriously. It was a lot. No, of fun. yeah. We broadcast from a spaceship. Uh, it was great. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you had, he has been to Mars. I have. I've been all over the uh, universe. So, so the thing is, the problem with an interview show, as you guys will learn, is that if your guest is really sucky, <laughs> it's really hard to pull a great <laughs> show out of that. And if your guest is great, then it's it's a very it's a great show. And so you start going, man, this is all hinging on another person. And I'm a control freak. I freely admit it. So that was one thing. Like, how do I remove this wild card of the guest? <laughs> and, and yet, how do I tell these great stories? And then um, Mike Rowe, uh, the way I heard it, is I, I'm a big fan. And he just crafts yeah. this story every week. And I'm like, 10 minutes, one story. And I'm like, I like that. I, I know there's so many paranormal podcasts and I don't ever want to do anything the way other people do it. There's no point. It's been done. I want to do my own thing. And I, I, I've got a friend who works in radio locally. And I said, hey, man, what if we told stories? What if we, you know, when I find these old newspaper articles from 1860 that have got these descriptive quotes from, from people who are long dead, what if we had voice actors read those? Not us. I don't want to read someone else's words. Let the mm -hmm. voice actor. And so we sort of came up with this formula where we start with the present. We go back in time, we travel through time, we interact with the past with these voice actors with sound effects, which at times are cheesy, but if you can embrace the cheese. No, I and, like and the just, cheese. Yeah, just, I mean, yes, the footsteps are a sound effect. You know, it's like step, <laughs> step, step. But man, I think it really helps set the mood and put you in that place with this theater of the mind. And it's I a have a campfire story that you're telling with me. That's it. That's it. But it's it's true, it's accurate, and it's about 10 minutes. And so there's so many stories just from the New England area. And then something happened. We've been doing this for two years. We haven't missed a single week in over two years. We've done it like 108 episodes nice. in a row every Thursday at noon, never missed. When people are on vacation, we have to do a couple ahead to you know make them come out on time. And so uh, what's, what's amazing, though, is the response. I'm getting an email like a day now or a, a Facebook message a day saying, have you heard about such and such a legend? And at this point, I've awesome. started to, yeah, exactly. The job's getting easier. And not only that, the stories they're suggesting are so obscure. I've never heard of them. And like when a guy like me hasn't heard of it, I get excited. You yeah, know, right. I'm like, how did I miss <laughs> that? So they're, I, I'm, I'm putting them in a spreadsheet who sent it to me so we can give them a shout out. And I got, you know, if I live to be 100, I ne I'll never run out of stories just from this region. And and people are catching on. They're attending my, uh, I do a story tour every fall where, I mean, between now and mid-November, I think I've got 40 dates where I'll be all over New England just telling stories in front of an audience. So these give me new stories to tell and, and people tell me stories there. And it's just this community that's just growing on itself. And it's amazing. I'm almost a little jealous. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> <laughs> it, just, it is a ton of fun and everybody should be listening to it, especially if it's 10 minutes. 10 I, minutes. That's it. Yeah. I listened to one when I was showering. You know. So I was in the shower with you? That's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh. We're very intimate. What's better than winning a screenplay contest? How about being flown out to Park City during the Sundance Film Festival or to the jazz capital of the country, New Orleans? How about London, Chicago? And on top of all of that, we will organize a table read of your winning project with a cast of amazing actors and your very own director. To quote past Table Read My Screenplay winner Andy Maycock, it was the highlight of my career thus far, and the prize money was just the icing on the cake. Join us on a trip to some of the most exciting film festivals in the world, all with a focus on you and your prize-winning script. Go to tablereadmyscreenplay.com to learn more, submit, and start the next stage of your screenwriting adventure. New England area, six states, and I heard you cycle through each week. That's right. So every if, if this week is Rhode Island, in six more weeks, it'll be Rhode Island again. And um, yeah, we've had complaints. Someone's like, oh, man, you leave Massachusetts high and dry. I was like, dude, every six weeks is Massachusetts. 
<laughs> there's six states. I want to give the spread the love around. I have the haunted New England calendar, something I've done every year for the last five years. A photographer friend of mine who takes these great eerie pictures, and I write stories, and so we've we've put that out every year. And just um, there's 350 of them. We've already moved through a third of them in the first week, and it's just uh, just a fun project. Yeah, I, you know the whole podcast craze is just getting bigger, and there's it. What amazes me is how many there are available, and oh, they're still getting a ton of downloads. People are still listening. It's it's not like it's that crowded. I mean, it is, but you know, you got niches. Well, so let's talk money. Someone may be thinking like, Jeff, you give this. And by the way, those 10 minutes, I'm guessing is about 10 hours a week for me. If I had to talk, you know, the research, okay. the writing, yeah. wow. the recording, the editing, mm-hmm. uploading from like soup to nuts, it's probably about 10 hours per episode. So that's like a full, very full work day uh, per week for that little 10 minute episode. So we have patrons, Patreon patrons, but that just, all that just covers is like the hosting and some advertising we do and like rubber bracelets and stickers. There's absolutely no profit in the podcast whatsoever. However, I've written all these scripts. I've saved all my sources. If someone said, I'm ready for the New England Legends book, I could knock that out one yeah. week. Like, give me a week. I'll, I'll take the scripts. I'll rework it into prose. I've got my photographer friend. So I will at some point push a book. It's also filling my lecture schedule. So I monetize it in other ways. But this, if it was straight up making money off the podcast, even though we've had a million downloads, a million, the podcast on its own just pays for itself and really nothing more. I think that's a way most people go nowadays. They, they want to create something new. And if they can't self-fund it just right off the bat, they'll create a Patreon page or do a Kickstarter, GoFundMe, yada, yada, yada. I was surprised. I don't think I've ever been to someone's Patreon page and seen only one level of donation available. Yeah. You know, so I, I, what was the I, thought process behind that? Yeah. So I, first of all, so we have a 10 minute episode and I get that people want to be more involved. So our patrons, we have a, like we do a bonus episode, which is just my co-host Ray and I talking about a little bit more in depth about the research that went into the most recent, like two episodes. And so, uh, and just stuff we have going on in our lives, emails we got, just, just that kind of thing for our patrons. So that's bonus content just for them. We ask for three bucks a month. It's a, it's a 10 minute podcast. So Mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of feel like, you know, it's not like there's a perception that we just kind of like knock these things out doing a one hour interview show for me would be way less time than writing a 10 minute <laughs> script sure sound effects. like you know it's uh <laughs> but people don't quite understand the difference um and that's okay they don't have to the consumer of it uh, just thinks like oh it's 10 minutes jeff i'm not going to give you a ton of money but that's okay so i i didn't i didn't even know what else to offer so we, we just said hey three bucks a month if you want to help the cause i didn't want to make it too expensive and we've had a few people do it but also too if, if someone out there is interested in podcasting the costs are like nothing i mean our hosting is like 20 bucks a month and that's because i use really good hosting um, you could you could find hosting for ten dollars a month. You yeah. go get a decent microphone, a decent recorder. Your your entry into this world is not a lot, but the craft you have to have something to say. You know you have to have uh, a style and a way to get it in front of people, and that's what sets you apart. So well, and that's uh, what I've been telling yeah. all of our writers recently that you know we have a whole stash of really talented people through the ISA and just for, through working in the entertainment industry. If a writer is looking to make a short film. Yeah, it's ten to thirty thousand dollars to try to produce a short film for maybe eight minutes or something that you might get into a festival. You could do twenty thousand dollars on a fully produced full season of an incredibly high end fiction podcast. <laughs> oh, based God, on yeah. IP, you know, and suddenly because a lot of the people that we've met with, we had a, a an event with women in film um, on Tuesday. One of the the panelists created a podcast. She's in her fifth season now. It's a fiction podcast, and it's getting set up at, at HBO as a show. So not only was she building an audience and mon- slightly monetizing some of that show, but now it's turning into an actual TV show in terms of what she wanted to do for the rest of her life anyway as a writer. So there are so many ways to benefit from this whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. But but it also comes down to like you, you've got to have something to say. You know, you've got to have right. some angle on it. And um, and I think that's what, when we when we were talking about doing the podcast, I was like, what can I do that's different? And so Mike Rowe was doing this short form thing that I loved. And when I tell stories, you know, Scott's seen me tell these kinds of stories in front of an audience. Each story is like seven minutes, eight minutes. And I was like, that's that's the most fun I have is being in front of a live audience and and telling these like weird little little tales and i and i was thinking well that's that's perfect that fits perfectly for for what this 
this is. And and it's it's catching on. You know, we're, we've got our audience. It's growing. Our numbers increase week after week. You still you still hope for that that big pop. You for like Matt Damon to be like, oh, me and Tom Brady were listening to the New England Legends podcast this weekend, and <laughs> yeah. boy. Are, Boy, are we hooked. You know, thanks for tweeting that, Matt Damon. You know, that would be amazing if you could We'll see that. what we can do. Yeah. I mean, is it, is it, it's not a big ask, right? It's just a tweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to get into some juicy stuff. Obviously, the most fun you have is telling stories. And I, we don't necessarily want this to be just a storytelling podcast. We want a little bit of both. You know, we want to know... Sure all this history behind who you are, but then also some of the fun that you've had. And I think a way to get into that is just asking a really open-ended question, some of which you've already answered. But I think I want to get beyond this idea because it's so much fun. But this question of why do you do this? What is it that drives you? Yeah. So so I grew up in an old New England town and I had friends whose houses were haunted. And I remember having sleepovers at age like 12 and would break out the Ouija board and try to make contact. And I was just <laughs> intrigued. You know, I thought this was... This was so wild because it wasn't Hollywood. It wasn't blood dripping out of the walls. There was no head spinning around. It was just someone else lives here with us. So don't tell your parents. They'll think we're crazy. So I thought that was really <laughs> intriguing. After I started writing in college and then I was writing for the college newspaper, I'd come home and I'd be a stringer for my my local newspaper. And around October, you go looking for ghost stories. And that's I was a features guy. I never really wanted to write news. I wanted <laughs> to write features. And so you go looking for haunted places. And I love history. So you uh, sometimes I'd find the history back up some of these ghost stories. This is the mid 90s. This early days of the web, our newspaper had an article I did with an interview with Ed and Lorraine Warren. And they were the people that uh, the Conjuring movie, they, yeah, that was amazing. one of their cases and Amityville, they worked on that and, and so many other things. And, and I knew them since I was 12 years old. They lived in the next town over. So I had interviewed them and that article was getting 10 times the traffic as all the other articles combined on our, our <laughs> newspaper website. And keep in mind, this is like 1997. So this is an early, early web. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, shoot, the newspaper went out of business. I still had some of my articles. So I started a website called ghostvillage.com back in 1999. 20 years ago and it was just six web pages and I said well tell me your ghost story and every month or two someone would send in their ghost story and then I just kept publishing them and so six web pages eventually turned into 50,000 pages of content millions upon millions of hits uh, message forums long before there was a Facebook and Twitter and stuff and then from there I said wow I've got all this these great stories, these research articles. I was writing about more haunted places. At the time, I was working for a tech company because I was in a lot of debt, and they were sending me all over the world. To uh, I was in Paris, and I was in Calgary. And How old when were I, you? 23, maybe? Oh, my 20, God. 24. So they're sending me all over the world, and between meetings, I'm sneaking off and going to haunted places in Paris. And I'd come awesome. back and, and write about it for my website. And people are saying, how do you afford to go to Paris for your website? I'm like, I don't. I didn't pay a dime. You know, like this is, and not only that, this was the tech boom. I was on a five-star budget. I was eating in the nicest restaurants oh, in Paris, wow. <laughs> staying in killer hotels, and then, you know, writing ghost stories. And so I would, I would go to New Orleans, and I'd do all this stuff. And when I traveled for vacation, I, I would write ghost stories. So eventually, I reached out to a publisher and said, well, I, I think I should be writing a book. That's the next logical step. And in 2003, I got my first book deal. And at the time, I was still working for that tech company, and I got a $5,000 book advance, if anyone wants to just be impressed. And yeah, it took right. me like eight months to write that book, if you would like to divide eight months by $5,000 <laughs> and figure out my living expenses, you go right ahead. I went to my boss the first workday of 2004, and I said, hey, I got to resign. And he's like, are you going to a competitor? I said, no, no, no. I, I just got a book deal. And he's like, how much? I said, $5,000. And he's just, his jaw hits the floor. He says, I'm paying you a lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, nobody is more aware of that than me. Nobody. <laughs> the, yeah. the, pay, the pay cut I'm taking right now is substantial. <laughs> but uh, to his credit, he gave me tons of freelance work for the next like two years, which was just enough to let me scrape by until I could write more books and then kind of transition from this this you know guy that was hustling and marketing you know then moving on to to being a full time writer so I'll, I'm forever grateful to him. At what point did somehow the the Ghost Adventures team? meet you, find you, show up on their radar or vice versa? Yeah. So I had written a bunch of books uh, from 2004. I was doing like a few books a year because it doesn't pay very much, as I already told you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you got to work in volume. So I'm, I'm doing that. I'm starting to do live lectures and things like that. And then uh, in 2008, 
uh, I got a phone call from Zach Bagans, who's the host of Ghost Adventures, and a friend we have in common, Dave Schrader. He asked Dave, I need a guy that knows haunted places all over the world and is like a good researcher. And Dave said, Jeff, he's the guy. He writes these books. This is what he does, Ghost Village. So Zach called and said, hey, you, you want to work on this show? We've got eight episodes for the Travel Channel. And I said, you know, that's, that's interesting. I've never worked for the medium of television. I've worked newspapers and magazines and books and the web. But yeah, why not? And so we worked on that, and it was just supposed to be eight episodes. That was it. And uh, we went into production, hmm. and it was, a, it was really cool to be part of something from the ground up, and everybody could share their ideas, and it was exciting. And then this, the show started to air in, uh, was, I think it was the fall of 20, 2008, and uh, episode two airs, and suddenly the Travel Channel calls everybody and says, hey, guys, how fast could you get back into production? And oh, wow. So, so we said, I, I guess tomorrow. I mean, is that, that fast <laughs> enough? And so that was our last day off was 2008. And uh, at this point, what was supposed to be eight episodes, I've worked on just Ghost Adventures, I think 210 Crazy. broadcast hours of primetime you know <laughs> unreal crazy. and then and then i've worked on spin-off shows and miniseries i mean i think i'm up to close to 300 hours of production uh, broadcast production on just paranormal television well you've become the go-to researcher for these ghost shows yeah which is cool right and, and again this is not a career i planned it just sort of happened one day i realized like wow i make a full-time living off of ghosts and Ghost Adventures is wonderful and I love it and it allows me to do a lot of other things, but it's not enough for me to live on. So I still write books. I still do my story tours and stuff like that. But it's been really awesome to be part of something that's been so successful and, and so visible. It's just fascinating. The, just the whole ghost investigation boom that has occurred because, you know, when you and Scott... Um, we're kind of getting into that realm of research and, you know, going on little investigations and checking out these haunted places. Scott did his documentary, um, what, it was the late 90s or something, right, Scott? Yeah, it, it's funny. Your story echoes mine so much. I put a very amateur, very bad uh, documentary on Haunted Chicago out in 1999, and I had a little production company website, and it was the ghost story side that where I was just trying to promote the documentary I put out. The message board side of that went nuts. Because yeah. there just weren't that many places, I guess, for people with that interest to go. So they found either you or me, I guess. <laughs> Think about it. So the internet drew in the fringe first. The nerds, people like us, mm -hmm. right? I, I say this with love, you know, I, I, but like the people that are in yeah. fr fringy topics were finding a home online fast before it before went mainstream, before everybody went yeah. online. There was the fringe first. And when you're out there, uh, you know, longevity is is such a part of this game. And I think that's one of the things that young writers don't quite understand. They want to be successful like day one. And some of them do get the luck where they just explode out of nowhere. But for the rest of us, you can, I've been playing the long game, you know, and uh, it, it's just one thing building on another and a lot of work. And so I think maybe some of it was timing, but being out there since 99 and being visible doing this stuff has made a big difference. Yeah, it's, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, we were talking about this in the Women in Film event just this past week. Again, I bring it up is in terms of building your audience, but it's also about having something to say and then having a purpose, just being inspired and following that love and you've obviously you know from that moment you saw that person laughing at your article in college it was like oh my god i love this so yeah. you just followed that and i think it's extremely inspiring for everybody listening to to just use it as an example it, it sometimes it's going to be difficult from a monetary standpoint but you just figure it out and eventually things just become more fun and you're not just overwhelmed with having to pay bills but before we jump off let, let me just go back to long island for one second yeah it was um uh, long island of course synonymous with billy joel and uh, he spoke at my college once, and it Love was a really Joel. cool thing. Yeah, so he, he just it was just him on stage with a piano, 75% talking, 25% playing. And just the audience could ask questions. Like, for example, someone's like, I've always wanted to sing Piano Man with you. He's like, all right, come on up on stage. And he just oh went into God. the chorus, and the kid was like, you know, sing us a song. You know, And then and that was it. Okay, thanks. Get off stage. Oh, my God, thank <laughs> you. Right? Like, just the reason I bring this up is someone asked Billy Joel, a question that I'll never forget. They said, do you think you can have a full-time job, do music on the side, and still make it? And he looked off into the space for like a long time. He was really thinking about it. And he just comes back to the microphone and he says, no. And he let that hang in the air for a second. And then he said, <laughs> however, I need to eat. I need clothes on my back. I need a roof over my head. I need gas in my car. 
as everybody does. So when I spent my first year as a musician, I had to make this piano provide those things for me. I had to figure that out. So I worked every single night in this crappy bar, figuring out what songs make people give me the biggest tips, what gets the crowd going and drinking and hanging around, how loud to play, how not loud to play. All of that stuff, I worked it all out night after night for a year and hustled, living you know, real thin to figure that all out. And then I wrote a song about it, that experience, called Piano Man. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I love kind, that. Kind of all worked out. And I went, wow, that's true. So when I quit my job in 2004 for a $5,000 advance, I had to figure out a way to make ghosts and, and writing put beer in my fridge and pizza on my table. <laughs> And ramen on the stove. Yeah. You know, we always talk about it, when you're crafting a story, you got to raise the stakes. Perhaps you just have to do that to yourself sometimes. We all know people that are so talented, but either won't take a risk or have no mm -hmm. drive. Oh, yeah. No drive. That's the best part. You know, like I know some talented people just with that were born without drive. And I'm like, you're never going to make it ever. And I know some people that are so driven and not that talented. And I'll be damned if they're not, you know, like really successful. Well, I, I just Scott, out of curiosity, before yeah, we jump ahead. off of the ghost adventures, how does the process work? What does an episode look like? Do you pitch ideas? Do they come yeah. to you? There's a lot of moving parts at this point. We've got people that are always looking for locations. It used to be just me. I'm, I'm grateful that now we have help. Sometimes Zach will say, hey, I want to be in this city. Or the network will say, you need to be in this place and, and find something there. We can't do you know, an endless, you know, it can't be prison after prison after prison. You know, you've got to mix up sure. the type of locations you're going to. So that's always in the mix. You know, oh, we just did a private residence. Now let's do an abandoned building. We just did one. Let's do that. So that's one part of it. And then once it's decided where we're going to go, then it's just handed to me, which I love. I love that. And, and I'm wow. generally mostly left alone to go and find anything I can about the history. So these guys know before they go in, this, this is what happened here. Here's where history left a mark. Here's the death. Here's the murder. Here's the, the places where people have had experiences. I help find the folks that have had experiences who share their stories and I get them beforehand. So our host knows what to ask. And how and many whack jobs have you come across? And I've talked to thousands upon thousands of people, not just for ghost adventures, but my own work over the years. And I can tell, I can tell when you're making it up. I can tell when you're, you're just trying to recite something you heard on another paranormal show. And I can tell when you just take a deep breath and you go, look, man, I don't know what this means, but this is what happened to me. Even if you, you can't explain it, even if you're, if, even if you say, look, I don't even know if there's such a thing as ghosts, but this man in a top hat walked out of the wall, looked right at me and then vanished. And you go, yeah, well, if that's not a ghost, I don't, I don't have another word for you, but that's good enough for me. You know, tell that story to our host before the investigation and we're good. So that's the part of it. And then I try to just give them story angles. This is what could be going on. And then they investigate and whatever happens, happens. That's fun. Jeff, as I mentioned earlier, each time you are speaking at an event, I know that's going to be an hour well spent going to watch Jeff talk. And yes, you do cover a lot of things that you talk about that you've uncovered through all the different uh, types of research you've done. But you've also lived big within the last year. I know every time I've seen you, there's been another grand adventure under your belt. And I think that's a, a, a very important thing. Your writers need to learn. They need to experience, though. I mean, you've talked about climbing Kilimanjaro and, and skydiving on your birthday. Can you just kind of speak to that as being part of your process? And also, I'm curious how you how you craft, what's the secret to your one hour presentations, how you put those together, because they're always so engaging. Yeah, thank you. So I, I um, uh, when you write books, when you make television shows, even when you record podcasts in general, you don't get to sit in the lap of the person consuming it and say, was that good? Was this a good page? Is that a good paragraph? You know, mm -hmm. is, did, did this part of the story really get you? You get feedback. And, and after years of doing this, you, you sort of know as a craftsman what's good, but you don't quite know. When you tell a story in front of an audience, you know in real time when it's working. And even if you told the same story last night in front of a different crowd and they were eating out of your hand, tonight mm -hmm. they're not. And you got to dig in and perform and you got to pull some energy out of a place that, that uh, might be really deep within you and say, this is why you should listen. And that part of it is just magic. There's, there's absolute paranormal supernatural magic that happens between a performer and an audience, whether it's a band, a, 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 you know, a dance or, or, a, you know, a play, whatever it is. Sure. There's an energy in the room that is different every single night 
and you sometimes get to ride a wave that's just incredible and other nights you just go man i gotta i gotta work a lot harder so i think that's part of it is to is that that performance of it um and and recognizing what elements make the audience lean forward and that's just that's just experience that's just many many hours of doing it in front of a crowd so each year i come up with a theme usually around the winter i say what's my theme going to be this year and a few years ago i climbed kilimanjaro and it was one of the most profound experiences of my life i wrote a memoir about it. I'm currently shopping it with publishers right now and um, mm. hope, hoping to get that published. It was just one of the most profound, life-changing things I've ever done because I set this lofty goal. I did it to honor my brother-in-law who had died of cancer. I did it to raise money for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And it was just this incredible moment um, on that mountain that was not at the summit, by the way. The, the most incredible moment was right at the rim of the volcano at, at sunrise. And it just it, it oh, changed everything. Wow. Yeah, just watching the sun. We had, we'd, it was six days to get to the top, and we had been hiking all night to, to get to the summit for sunup. And to watch the sunrise over this cloud at like 18,500 feet, it was just, my God, you know, I'll never forget Jesus, it. Jesus, yeah. And you can't, you're fighting for every breath, and it's cold as cold can be. And just I found such hope in that moment, and I, I clicked a picture that came out really good and I've given out that picture to, to hundreds of people with a story of hope and so that year that just bled into my presentation that believe it or not I find hope in ghost stories and the hope is that we go on that we can still have influence even after we're gone and of course we can our, our, our loved ones that influenced us and so on and so the following year I said well I, I can't tell that story again people know I did it so <laughs> what else is there and so yeah. uh, <laughs> so you know it's it's a funny thing you you, you don't want to tell that when there's an audience that's already heard your story you don't want to tell them the same thing again so the following year i said all right what can i do this year and in the winter i said fear what am i what am i afraid of and i said my biggest fear is falling not heights but falling you know actually it's basophobia it has a term it has an actual term Hmm. to it which which is great because you're like oh good it's got a term i'm not the only (laughs) one and then you're like oh crap i've got a thing i'm a basophobe like i've got this affliction so i said all right I'm going to I'm going to skydive and I'm going to film it because it just scares the living hell out of me. I'm putting it off and putting it off cuz I don't want to do it. And and by the way it's expensive. Right? It's not like, you know, yeah. it's not cheap. It's hundreds I got to pay to be terrified. Yeah. Right? yeah. And, and then so and then I found this place in Connecticut and on your birthday it's like 40% off or something if you do it on your actual birthday. And I'm like, well, that's a sign. I'll do it on my birthday, which is in August, early August. And so uh, the week before, I hardly slept. I'm sweating. I'm petrified. And I'm like, this is insane. Insane. I'm paying all this money <laughs> to go do something that's just going to scare the living crap out of me. And I went there that day alone, no one with me, no crew or anything. Oh my and God, I, that's even worse. I know. And I just, I, I said, all right. And then there was this cloud cover. So we had to wait and wait and wait. And then the plane ride up is like 25 minutes. Like I thought you'd just be up and out in like seconds before you could even think about it. But yeah, no, right. you circle and you go up to 14,000 feet and they open the door. They open the door, of course. <laughs> and, and you look down, we're going 85 miles an hour and it's 14,000 feet down. And uh, dear God, and then these two solo guys jump out first. They just leap out of the plane. And I'm just out of my mind petrified. And I'm tandem because I've got an instructor. (laughs) And we waddle up to the door and I feel this rush of wind. And suddenly she just pushes us and out we go. And I have never been so aware of the weight of my body in that moment, like just feeling the earth sucking me down at 125 miles an hour, terminal velocity in 12 seconds and just absolute. But then also the release of it, just saying like, it's out of my hands now, right? This is it. It's it's completely out of my hands. There's nothing I can do except trust God, the universe, the instructor on my back, (laughs) the, the, the little tiny thin sheet of fabric in this backpack that will hopefully save our lives, you know, (laughs) like, and, uh, and then to just come down to the ground and it was over a few minutes later and I'm on the ground and they take the harness off and they're like, well, you can go. Our business here is done. (laughs) (laughs) Gonna call an Uber. (laughs) Yeah. Clean yourself up and leave. Yeah. (laughs) So the funny thing, I sit, I get in my car and two minutes after being on the ground and all of a sudden every pore in my body opens up and I'm sweating like you're in the shower, just 
whole flop sweat, you know, just adrenaline dump. And I went, wow, that was really something. And I, I faced a fear, but, uh, but I didn't conquer it by any stretch, but I re- but I did face it. And that was pretty magical. And then, you know, so every year I just try to find this theme and let it just ooze into what I'm doing that year and, and look at the world from that perspective. And it turns into this grand adventure. This year I went to Machu Picchu in Peru and I climbed up that mountain and I, you know, explored how the, the, the Peruvians deal with the dead and the, the mummification and all this other stuff. And I think every year I just want to challenge myself to learn and experience something profound that gets me out of my comfort zone and shakes things up. Well, you're braver than I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even like going to a crowded theater. <laughs> Let's jump out of an airport. Well, it's inspiring to say the least, man. Yeah. Well, it's fun. You know, and it, I think you, you do have to shake things up and, yeah. um, uh, because it's so easy to stay in your right, especially when you're a writer, because you, it's so solitary, yeah. you know, no, no one can do it with you. No one can hit half the keys for you. You know, you get the vowel, Scott, I'll, I'll hit the consonants, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it just doesn't work that way. You are given a task and you're all alone. And sometimes you get so excited about what you're working on and there's nobody to even share it with. If we were building a house together, I could be like, man, how great does that wall look? You know, this yeah. is going to be awesome. You can see the progress. You can go out to the street. People can drive by and admire it. No one can see the house I'm building on on my word program on my computer. <laughs> you know, like it's it's uh, not until like much later. And so it can be very lonely and, and solitary. even then people may not see it. Yeah, most people won't see it. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and you got to get over that and just say, well, shoot, this story compelled me to tell it for some reason. And mm-hmm. let's just let it fly out in the world and see what it does. I love that getting out of your uh, comfort zone and really, I don't know, pushing yourself. It, it's interesting because it makes me think, Max, that, you know, yes, our voice pressure points are can be formed young, but they don't stop forming. And Jeff, totally. you said earlier that you're a control freak as you were just talking about putting your podcast together. But here you are giving up, yielding all control to somebody that's strapped to you as you're falling to the earth and the, the lessons that... I don't know, your soul learns from that, uh, will then maybe in some ways inform future writing. Yeah. And I think too, like when you, when you shake things up, you grow, you grow as a person. And if you stop learning, stop growing, if you ever think you're the best at something, you're finished, right? I I still think my, my best work is ahead of me. And that is very comforting you know, for me to, to have this idea that, yeah, man, the, the next great story is still in front, not behind. Yeah. How would you go forward if you're like, ah, I peaked? I don't need to, you know, I'm never going to do better than what I just did. Plenty of people think they're amazing. Their egos are so huge, uh, creative people. And I guess you need some ego to, to get up in the morning. But at the same time, I'm like, well, if you think you're the greatest, how on earth are you going to improve? And at this point, you know, if you start playing a musical instrument in those first couple months, you get better and leaps, right? And bounds. You, you, oh, I've never touched a piano before. And suddenly one month later, you can play some chords and a little bit of a melody. And then six months later, you can sort of play a song. It's not perfect, but you got something there. If you keep playing, you're only going to get better by tiny increments, but you have to stay focused on getting better in those tiny increments because otherwise you're just done. Hang it up. And it's a constant state of being humble, you know, in no matter what the pursuit may be, if you're trying to learn the piano or play a sport, but especially I think in stories, but also stories about the unknown, whether it's paranormal, supernatural, just mysteries, is that how difficult to solve the mystery is humbling because you're like, oh, I can't figure this out. What's the answer? And so you're constantly looking for something you don't know. And I think that ultimately is what drives me as a storyteller, somebody who's just trying to figure out, you know, what is either the true story or if I'm telling a fiction story, how do I end this? Because I think the story might be better than me and it's humbling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, and and um, I know for me at this point, when I'm going to take on a new story, uh, it's it's actually a physiological effect. You know, if someone tells me something and they go, "Oh, there's a cold spot in my house," and I go, "Okay," you know, I, I don't mean I, I don't want to yawn in front of you, but you know, like eh, I've heard right. it. Yeah, or they go, "Hey, have you heard about the mad trucker of Copacut Road?" And you just go, "Listen, what? Clear my schedule. I'm on my way." <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm I'm not sleeping until I know what that is, and um and it's, it's you feel it in your gut where you just go oh I'm, you, I l- lurch forward and I say oh I, I guess I I got to deal with this. So one one question we're gonna ask all of our guests is uh you know 
especially as a researcher, you've come across so many great stories. And, um, and, and there's also great stories that we've heard about over and over again, whether it's the catacombs, since you mentioned Paris, or, of course, Resurrection Mary in Chicago. What is a story that you feel should be insanely famous that everybody knows, but it seems like nobody knows it yet? That the founder of Rhode Island, Roger Williams, was eaten by an apple tree. <laughs> That's our show, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you <laughs> hear from me next week. I, I'm guilty of, of leaning into my most recent yes. podcast episode. <laughs> However, it was like two weeks ago when I was doing a project on Roger Williams um, and his connection to the Narragansett Native Americans and so on. And I saw this little footnote that said, like, oh, people say he was eaten by an apple tree. And like, that's, of course, all my attention goes there. And I'm like, that's, <laughs> is that true? <laughs> And so I start looking into it and finding newspaper article after newspaper article. It's completely true. It's so true that uh, so what happened is and it's an amazing story. So the founder of Rhode Island, when he died, nobody, I'm not saying nobody cared, but he had had his time. You know, he was a governor of Rhode Island. He was the founder of Providence, all this other stuff. And when he passed away in the late 1600s, he was sort of like, eh, he buried in a family plot and that was it. But Roger Williams had these radical ideas for a Puritan. And that was that there should be a wall of separation between church and state. So a hundred years later, these guys are sitting around a room and, you know, writing the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights. And they said, that Roger Williams guy, he had a good idea. Separate church church and state. And so they, they incorporated that. And suddenly Roger Williams, the legend of Roger Williams gets this huge shot in the arm a hundred years after his death and more time goes by and, and Rhode Islanders start feeling downright proud of the old radical, right? Mm -hmm. So 1860 comes along and they say he shouldn't be buried in some backyard by, by a barn. He should have like a real memorial. He's the founder of Rhode Island. He's one of the framers of the constitution by, you know, his early work and so on. So they, they go in 1860 to exhume the body. And when they dig it up, they discover that the roots of an ancient apple tree had worked its way into the casket and around his body and sucking the nutrients of his decomposing corpse <laughs> up into the tree. And the article even said, think about all the neighbors and the marauding boys that had picked and eaten apples off this tree over the many many years how many people ate roger williams cannibals <laughs> so they took his body they took the tree root around his body and the rhode island historical society in 1860 brought it back and put it on display it is still on display to this very day i saw it this week in in, in a casket sized uh, display case at the rhode island historical society in providence and that is indeed the apple tree root that ate the founder of rhode island roger williams i gotta make it to providence yeah <laughs> 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 well, for stories like that and uh, over a hundred others, head on over to our New England Legends dot com. That's O U R New England Legends dot com. Yeah, and check out Jeff dot com. Right, Jeff, you got a website yeah. of your own. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All my stuff, all my appearances, and things like that are on there. Yeah. Well, so, this was just a pleasure. I feel like we could have you on every episode, yeah. and maybe we will try to have you on again. <laughs> Sounds good. No, it was fun. Thanks for having me on as your first guest. If you are in the New England area, definitely try to see Jeff live somewhere this speech season. But also, he does make appearances outside of the New England area at different paranormal conferences. So definitely keep an eye out. Uh, do you want to throw any uh, social media out there for people as well? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, Exploring Legends is Instagram and um, Facebook. And then The Jeff Belanger is Twitter. And I'm always happy to uh, engage with people on social media. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs>